afternoon, everyone. My name is Roberta Hayashi. I'm a judge of the Santa Clara County Superior Court, and it's my very great pleasure to be able to welcome you all to this year's Cormans Day event. Uh, the Santa Clara County Superior Court, the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, uh, the Asian Law Alliance, the Fred Chi Cormans Institute, uh, have uh, and the count, um, I care. Uh, the Council for American Islamic Relations have been very pleased to be able to work together. This is now our fourth year of commemorating Fred T. Cormont's legacy. This year is a special year because it is the 100th anniversary of his birth. Every year we came here and we said, you know, is this, what are we going to talk about? And, you know, because the, but the current events keep making the legacy of Fred Coromansu more and more relevant every year. And um, so I'm so pleased that you all could join us, sponsor organizations, um, some of whom are going to be here, part of the panel, and I'll let uh, Robert Honda introduce them. But I'd also like to specifically recognize Aggie Komodo um, from the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. It was through Aggie's friendship with me that we got this started. Uh, four years ago, when I swore in as the judge of the Santa Clara County Superior Court, I swore in on the Cormans today. And Aggie was there, and we said, the message that we're talking about, the link between Fred Korematsu and justice, has to be perpetuated and continue on. Earlier this week, we uh, commemorated another civil rights hero, Martin Luther King. One of, his, um, one of his quotes that's a favorite of mine is that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And it is in that spirit of fighting threats to justice that I became a judge, that a lot of you are here today, and we're here to talk about what Fred Cormont did to fight injustices anywhere that are a threat to justice everywhere. To lead us in that discussion, I'm very pleased to introduce Robert Honda. Actually, I think he's somebody who all of us who've been uh, watching the news in Santa Clara, in uh, the Bay Area for the last 30 years know Robert. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, Robert is, uh, was named in, in both 2015 and 2016 as Reporter of the Year by the Associated Press. He's a reporter for NBC Bay Area News at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and 11 p.m. He joined NBC Bay Area in June of 2014, re returning to the station where he began his career more than three decades ago. But before that decade in broadcasting, he is a, um, somebody who has been a South Bay native. He attended Sunnyvale High School, De Anza College, San Jose State, and won a journalism contest for an internship at KMTV Channel 11, a moment that he describes as his first real step as a broadcast journalism career, and that was when he was just a, a mere child just a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> We're extraordinarily, extraordinarily pleased to have um, someone who has been a outspoken person in the media, a role model for many young people through his work in journalism. Please welcome Robert Lama. Thank you, Roberta. Yes, being the first 10-year-old college graduate was something uh, quite an honor for me. Uh, I apologize uh, for uh, uh, cutting my arrival time so closely. I was trying to watch the replay of the Australian Open this morning, and uh, Naomi Osaka, Osaka who won the uh, Australian Open. I have to make some uh, room for another poster next to each row now. Anyway, so uh, I am very happy to be here uh, to uh, celebrate Fred Korematsu. Um, we actually just did a program for Asian Pacific America, uh, my talk show with Karen. Uh, that's running tomorrow. And uh, of course, he's been a hero of mine my whole life. 
And so I'm very proud to be here and to introduce this great panel to talk about some of these important issues that his legacy not only helped uh, reinforce in terms of the uh, justice, but also would continue to be relevant today, as Roberta mentioned. First of all, I'd like to uh, introduce Karen Korematsu. She is the founder and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute, and the only one here who got to call him daddy. <laughs> In 2009, on the 25th anniversary of the reversal of Fred's U.S. Supreme Court conviction, this proud daughter established the Fred T. Korematsu Institute. Since her father's passing in 2005, Karen has carried on Fred's legacy as a civil rights advocate, public speaker, and a public educator. She shares, she shares her passion for social justice and education at K-12 public and private schools, colleges and universities, law schools, teachers' conferences, and organizations across the country. Karen's work and her father's legacy extends to advocating for civil liberties for all communities, and she addresses current issues that draw lessons from the past. She has signed on to many uh, amicus briefs in several cases opposing violations of constitutional rights arriving after, arising after 9-11. And again, you can also see her as a guest on my show tomorrow morning. Please welcome Karen Marmont. Another familiar face to all of you, and certainly to me. Uh, sometimes she does recognize me unless I'm holding a microphone in front of her. Uh, Zara Malou is a civil rights attorney and the executive director of the Bay Area chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, known as CARE. Zara facilitates trainings and workshops as a part of CARE's grassroots efforts to empower the American Muslim community and build bridges with allies on civil rights issues. She also provides direct legal services for victims of law enforcement targeting and Islamophobia. Under Zara's leadership, CARE SFBA has filed lawsuits against the United States Department of Justice, Abercrombie & Fitch, and Southwest Airlines representing American Muslims facing discriminatory treatment. CARE SFBA has also significantly expanded its Know Your Rights sessions to mosques and community members in the San Francisco Bay Area, while also providing direct legal representation for civil rights violations, including FBI interviews, employment discrimination, airport harassment, school bullying, and hate crimes. Please say hello to Zara Malou. Our next panelist, Teresa Castellanos, has worked with immigrant communities for over 25 years. She began as a labor organizer with Justice for Janitors and the Health Workers Union, and worked for a Catholic Charities Immigration Program, leading the organization's citizenship efforts in the mid-1990s. For the past 19 years, she has been a guiding force behind the Santa Clara County's citizenship and immigrant integration programs. Teresa's efforts have brought attention to the immigrant experience in Silicon Valley and to the multiple ways communities can participate in the improvement of their lives through community access, civic participation, and engagement. Teresa is the trustee Area 1 representative on the San Jose Unified Board of Education and has been since 2012, and she was re-elected in 2016. Congratulations, and please welcome Teresa Castellano. Susan Hayashi is a formidable activist in the Japanese American community. She was a key member of the Neil Manchi Outreach Committee and the National Coalition for Redress Reparations in the fight to obtain redress for the incarceration of Japanese Americans by the U.S. government during World War II. She was appointed to the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund Board by President Clinton and served as its vice chair from 1996 to 1998. More recently, Susan has been a major force in Japanese Muslim solidarity. One example, in 2017, hundreds marched from San Jose, Japan town to San Jose City Hall to express that solidarity between Japanese Americans and American Muslims. Two years ago, Susan, along with the San Jose, Silicon Valley, and Sequoia chapters of the Japanese American Citizens League, the Nihomachi Outreach Committee, the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, the DeAnza College California History Center's Audrey Edna Butcher Civil Liberties Education Initiative, and Asian Law Alliance initiated the Unity Tags and Unity Pledge Campaign to stand up against scapegoating and hate mongering. The unity tags, the unity tags are displayed by the fellowship wall, and the tags are similar to the identification tags Japanese Americans were forced to wear on their way to incarceration camps. The tags read as follows, 
I will stand up against actions of the Trump administration or others that scapegoat Americans based on race, religion, or immigration status, no Muslim registry, no deportations. Wearing that tag proudly, please welcome Susan Pines. Our next panelist will be shared an ambitious project for uh, Japanese American legacies for future generations. We both enrolled our sons at the same time in the Japanese language schools. <laughs> I hope you had better luck than I did. Richard Fonda is a graduate of the of UC Berkeley. He attended law school at Santa Clara University, graduating in 1978, and has worked at the Asian Law Alliance since then. He was one of the founding members of ALA. Richard was an active participant in the movement to obtain redress and reparations for Japanese Americans, interned by the U.S. government during World War II, and in fact he was in a program, one of my first stories I ever did for a show at McNeil Lair News Hour on this issue. Uh, beyond that, after the tragic police shooting of Beach Cow Tree Tram in 2003, Kondo was active in advocating for justice for the Tran family. He facilitated the formation of the Coalition for Justice and Accountability that continues to advocate for humane police practices. Kondo currently serves as the Executive Director of ALA. Please welcome Richard Kondo. So please write any questions that you may have, and we will answer them during the question and answer portion of the program. We're going to allow a presentation by each of our panelists, first starting with Karen Kornamas. Karen? Oh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for, for being here, and uh, it's you know, really very special, obviously, that uh, my father's 100th birthday will all be on, on uh, this uh, Wednesday, January 30th. Um, you know, talking about, uh, when talking about my father's uh, le legacy, and, uh, you know, it, in some ways it's kind of a, uh, you know, happy and, and, and very kind of worrisome uh, emotion that my father's legacy has grown so much. But you know, it's it's certainly because of what's happening uh, across this country today. Uh, you know, never you know we did. My father passed away in 2005, and you don't know what's going to happen to someone's legacy when when they do pass away. I mean, they did. You know, certainly he had he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1998. Uh, he he you know crisscrossed this country and kept on with education because he didn't want something like the Japanese American incarceration to happen again. He was one of the first people after 9/11, 2001, you know, along with the JACL, to speak up against uh, the negative rhetoric. And, and actually, Attorney General Ashcroft of the Bush administration cited Corbett versus the United States as a possible reason to round up Arab Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps. Um, you know, he was, and he was living at that time, and he was so. He was so upset about this uh, that he, yeah, I asked him, I said, we were standing in the, in the kitchen in, in that, that day, and, and I said, well, Daddy, what do you think about this? And he said, well, well you know, why did he bother to open up his case if this is going to happen again? But, of course, that didn't stop him. You know, he, he always kept speaking up and, and, and you know, never, never gave up hope that we could make change. And he knew that the only way that we can make a difference is at least now, collectively, we were talking earlier, you know, about the, the, the difference of 1942 compared to now. At least we have the civil rights organizations and other organizations to speak up um, and fight, um, like, you know, care against this this neg negative rhetoric and, and the immigration issues and um, you know the racial profiling and now of course we're dealing with religious profiling. Uh, who would have thought that we'd be at, at this point? But at least to have my father be, you know, he's he's has this day named after him, uh, which was established and or signed by legislative bill in 2010 by Governor Schwarzenegger, um, and it's a per in perpetuity for the state of 
California. So this is now coming up like our ninth um, um, anniversary of Fred Komatsu um, uh, Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution, and the governors just declare it Fred Komatsu Day, and also the superintendent of public instruction. So to um, it, you know to encourage teachers. Uh, and students to start and study about, you know, my father's fight for justice, but what it, what it means today. And, uh, and it even, you know, it's been busy because, you know, uh, Florida, Virginia, New York City, Hawaii, uh, all have their days now in perpetuity, and now uh, the, the city of Philadelphia signing proclamation. I'm going to uh, Phoenix for Arizona's proclamation with the governor, the secretary of state. Uh, so we are making inroads. But what my father's day means, is, a, is, a, is about what, what the name says, about our civil liberties and the Constitution. My father wanted to, you know, kept fighting to be sure that, that our rights uh, and, and our Constitution would, were upheld. And, and I think that's, you know, to remember that, that's the, the takeaway that now uh, also, you know, that you can make that difference to be civically engaged. The Cormontsu Institute, we're teaching civic education in the schools. Is, you know, Fred Cormontsu really represents civic education and, and engagement. And we all can be a part of that. You know, we did well in the last election, but there's still so much to do in reaching out, you know, just reaching out to other communities. And when you, when you leave here, be like pebbles in the pond. You know, go out and share what you've learned. Just don't keep it to yourself. And to build up these coalitions and to work across communities because that's how we're going to make a difference. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. Is our Yes, everybody gets their own microphone. Um, I'll share a couple of um, brief thoughts. The, the first is to say one is, Good to be back with all of you. As you may recall, this weekend marks the second anniversary of the first Muslim ban. And I remember sitting with you in 2017, um, just maybe 16 hours after it had been signed, and having to leave this panel to rush to SFO because of the protests that had started to mobilize, which by the way broke records that weekend. The largest, the highest BART traffic to SFO in a single weekend, and the largest indoor uh, protest sustained over a period of time uh, in, in the region. And so with that in mind, I guess what I'll share is, is three things. The first is I'm the daughter of immigrants, and my work is to protect civil rights and human rights for the Muslim community and by extension all Americans. But it always strikes me, the irony of doing that as I myself sit on the stolen land, as I myself sit in a place where people suffered so I could be here. I had some indigenous friends tell me recently, and this framing has stuck with it, which is whenever you meet an indigenous person, remember that you're meeting the survivor, a survivor of genocide. And so coming to terms with that as a young daughter of immigrants, American, is what starts my path to radically caring about our constitution. And then realizing that what many in the Muslim community are experiencing today follows in line with what indigenous people, what undocumented people, what black people have experienced for so long. And so I struggle with the idea of the Constitution, which was written by slaveholders, right? And the people who worked to protect slavery. And then I struggle with the idea of American values, when at best they're American aspirations, right? They are not values that most people, people like many of us in this room, have had the opportunity to fully experience. And so, why, why was I surprised when Donald Trump was elected? That is a question that I've struggled with, and it's because I was optimistic that we were moving forward. But what this presidency has helped me understand is that for many in our country, we are not moving forward at all. Moving forward is seen as a threat. And so today, people in my community are separated by the Muslim ban. Like people coming from South and Central America are separated by the attempts at a border wall by kidnapping of children, like black families are separated by the prison industrial complex. But for those who forget, people right now from Iran, Syria, Somalia, Libya, or Yemen, all countries that we have bombed or paid other people to bomb, cannot come to the United States. Some of you may have followed the story of Ali and Shema over the winter, uh, Yemeni family, child was less than two years old, they realized he had a degenerative brain disease. 
And they waited and they waited through like attempts at moving forward their immigration paperwork to see if they could get his mom to come to the United States. And finally, when it became clear that the only attempt he had to live was at medical treatment he could get at UCSF in Oakland, they sent they sent the young child ahead of the mom, hoping mom would follow soon. But when she sent him away, she never thought that that would be the last time that she would see him lucid, that she would interact with him. It took a lawsuit, over 25,000 emails to the State Department and members of Congress, and literally wall-to-wall -wall media coverage to shame the State Department into doing the right thing. And in talking to some of our attorneys who are closer to the case, they're always very intentional about making sure that we never say that the State Department did the compassionate thing or the State Department changed their mind, but the State Department was forced to take action, right? And that's that's where we are today. That ban has been upheld by the Supreme Court, the same Supreme Court that permitted the incarceration of Japanese Americans, upheld separate but equal, and of course for so long before that permitted slavery. And so where, where do we go from here? There has been a lot of reflection on the role that Nancy Pelosi has played in fighting back against the shutdown and fighting back against the racist monument that is the border wall that was proposed that held up everyone's lives for three weeks, four weeks, 35 days. And I think that for me, it's actually the workers that I find the most hope in, right? The workers who, when they attempted to strike under Nixon or Reagan, were threatened with arrest and some were arrested, but who despite that said, we are going to call out for more, right? It was the workers who brought a ground still at LaGuardia in New York yesterday who got uncomfortable in part because they were forced to, because they weren't being paid, but in part because they knew that it was going to take courage to move something forward, right? That they were going to have to put, as we would say, their bodies on the line, risk arrest, risk losing their jobs, to move something to a halt. And so when we went to, I went to DC when the Women's March was organizing opposition to the Kavanaugh hearings when they first began, and I remember my sister Linda, she said to us in a civil disobedience training the night before the first hearing, she said, you're going to be uncomfortable tomorrow. But that's what our country needs. Sit in the discomfort. Do the difficult and daring thing. And so in celebrating Fred Karamatsu's legacy and in thinking about what we all need now, it's to be uncomfortable. It's to take risks. It's to say, I'm going to go a little bit further. And what that means for each of you is different. But we do need to be less comfortable in an attempt to resolve what we're going through and build the America that we all deserve. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I'm not sure this will be a short and uncomfortable message, but I'm not sure this will be a short and uncomfortable message for us, but thank you. Teresa? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about myself before I start with this. I am a fourth generation American, I'm a Chicana, and I've been in the immigrant rights movement for 30 years. And sometimes I think there's the assumption that we're more homogenic than we are, and we're actually very diverse. And having grown up in Santa Clara County, I knew about the internment camps because my mom was a county worker, and her supervisors and the canneries were Japanese immigrants. And so, Although I wasn't aware about what she was talking about, that was always part of our growing up. We knew what had happened to the Japanese community. Like, we knew what had happened to us. Um, and I grew up as a Spanish-speaking child, even though I'm fourth generation American, I was a Spanish-speaking child. And I knew what it was like to sit in the classroom for till fifth grade and just daydream. And not being able to read until fifth grade and then all of a sudden have my life changed because I can actually participate in school. And so I think a lot of times we think about the things that fragment us instead of the things that bring us together. And to start off with, we all live in Silicon Valley. And we all live in the most diverse place on the planet. And we all get exposed to things, but we need to pay attention. And I think there's some lessons that I've learned in the immigrant rights movement. Number one is that we're more alike than we're different. Number two is that for a lot of the immigrant community and for a lot of communities of color, the fight to be included is what's made America great. I know the Constitution was not written for me. The Constitution wasn't written for most people. It was written for white, rich men. 
The beauty of our history as Americans is that every community that has fought to be included has made it for better for future generations. Whether you were working white people, whether you were women, whether you were African Americans, whether you were Japanese Americans, whoever it was that fought to be included made sure more of us were included. And I can say that when the 14th Amendment happened and the African American community became US citizens, Mexicans also became U.S. citizens. And so we're that interconnected in our history, and we are that interconnected in our survival. And so I think that is one of the big lessons that I learned. And in looking at the Fred Koromatsu Day, I think the beauty of his legacy is fighting for what is right, fighting for things when no one else agreed with you, fighting because it was at the core of his being that this was wrong, and why should he have to put up with this? Fighting for the future, because he ended up fighting for the future. He didn't get to reap the benefits of what he was fighting for, but he said, I'm standing up for this. And always speaking up about what he had suffered, I think we're living in a time where we're all feeling the abuse in our nation. We're being abused. And we're all at a place where we're waiting to see who gets slapped first or next. And so we're all in a abusive relationship. And so sometimes it's the LGBT community, sometimes it's the trans community, sometimes it's the Muslim community, sometimes it's the Latino community, but we're all waiting. Sometimes it's the working community. And so I think part of being in abuse and the part as a person that's being abused that we have to do is that we have to stand up. We have to say something. We cannot leave it in silence. If it is in silence, and if it is in darkness, we will suffer this for a lot more and longer. If we stand up and speak to it, we can start changing the relationship so that this is not what we're living. And so this is a time that we are currently living. We are living a time of abuse. Um, and all we have to do is look at the policies that are in place at this moment. And of course, I can't find my notes that I'm speaking right now. Um, we're living at a time where we're seeing children separated from their parents on purpose. Not by accident, this is on purpose. They were purposely classified as different numbers and as unaccompanied children when they were accompanied and given different numbers so we can never connect those families again. Because the child has one number, the parent has one, another number, the parent was deported, the parent was released. We don't know what happened to the parent, and the child has a different, completely different number. And we are seeing these children in front of judges when they are 2, 3, 5, 10, 11, 12 years old by themselves, without representation, without translation, and they're supposed to argue their immigration case. And we've taken it to that extreme where we have toddlers in the courtroom who might not even speak Spanish. They're probably speaking indigenous languages. And if we're looking at who has died and the big number of people that are being incarcerated right now, we're talking about an indigenous community, an indigenous community of this continent. We're also living in a time where um, we're shooting tear gas at children on the border because they're rushing to come in. We have an asylum process. It's not like there is no process that exists in place. It's not being used. And historically, when someone has asked for asylum, we have let them in the country, and we have let them fight their case, and if they win, they win, and if they don't win, they don't win. And right now, we're saying, you can't come into the country. We don't care if you're asking for asylum. We don't care if you're running for your life. Um, does that mean I'm done? Okay. <laughs> um, and, and we're saying, you know, we're saying even if you're in the country, we will deport you to another country that's not your country until you can finish your court proceedings. There's so many things that are illogical about the moment that we're living that all you can say is this is abuse because it makes no sense. And we're living in a time, which was already mentioned, where we would deny a mother her right to be with her dying child. That is such an inhumanity. And we can go to all our places of inhumanity. The housing issue is inhumane. The whole homeless issue is inhumane. And we have so many things to work on. 
But at the same time, we're only going to survive together. And that means that we need to have the hard conversations. We need to stand in solidarity. And more important than anything, we need to remember that never again is now. Never again is now. And to me, I've been around the Japanese community for a long time because I've been doing the immigrant rights movement and I do consider Richard Kanda one of my mentors. So for a long time, I've been coming to Japanese American events. And I think it was, even though I was around it, I would say maybe seven years ago, I realized, oh, it was an executive order that put everyone in German camps. Somehow I had like missed that part in my life, been surrounded by it, and I was like, that was a presidential order. And that was all US citizens. And so that means that can happen to us too. It's not going to be limited to one group. It's going to start with one group and then spread to another group. At this point, we're seeing Texans being told that a US passport is not enough to prove that they are Americans. I'm like, oh, who's next after that? And so I think we're living at a time where we really have to take the Frank Karamatsu example and start voicing what is wrong. Because in the context of craziness, you have to say, no, this is wrong. This is not who we are. Never again is now. Now, it's now. It's not five years from now. It's not two years from now. It's not even three months from now. It is now. We are living it now. We're not going to get to it. It is now. Just look at that trail of things that is taking place. And so in that context, community becomes so incredibly important because that is the way we're going to survive. We're going to survive together. So in any way that we can show each other solidarity, in any way that we can stand together, in any way that we can send a little bit of money to that organization that's trying to close the kids at the border, in any way that we can help a community member in this community that we live in, I think we have to take all those opportunities because we need to remember our humanity. And we're living in a time where we are, it is so much that sometimes we say, okay, don't feel, don't feel, don't feel, don't feel, don't look at it. I don't have to know more. And I'm not saying you have to look at all of it, because also we're living at a time where we need to take care of our mental health. If it's going to immobilize us, then no, don't become obsessed with it. But know enough of it to know that it ne never again is now. We have to take a step now. We have to talk now. We have to say this is wrong now, and we need to stand in solidarity now. I want, I'm inspired by Frank Karamatsu also, and what I'd like to talk about is what is the relationship between Frank Karamatsu and the chance of political change and political process. Um, when I was eight years old, I knew about the concentration camps because I was very lucky my parents had talked to me about it. I remember I told my third grade teacher that my parents had been put in a prison camp because they were Japanese. And my teacher said, that didn't happen. That was so weird to be gaslit by your teacher. Um, but it alerted me to the fact that there were a lot of things that people said and believed that I didn't think were true. I knew were true. I remember hearing two assertions, one about the forced exclusion and incarceration of Japanese Americans when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s. And my parents didn't tell me this, so I don't know exactly where I heard it, but I think it was kind of in the air. Um, one assertion was that Japanese Americans had gone to camp wholeheartedly. I, I remember, I think people have heard that before, right? Um, and the other one was that there was something wrong with Fred Karamatsu. So people may not know that, um, but there was a uh, <coughs> propaganda effort that originated in government films and statements and was picked up by newspaper commentary uh, it was in school textbooks. It was in casual conversation. It was what people knew was true. Uh, and it was propaganda that had been used for decades to belittle Japanese Americans, to minimize and rationalize the gross injustice done to them, and to deflect the hypocritical 
and racist double standard on the Bill of Rights. And with regard to Fred, it was used to cast doubt on the character of somebody who had resisted. Um, it's important to remember the strength of, of that uh, propaganda campaign that would cause us to question the character of somebody who had resisted the exclusion. And it's important to consider what it takes to fight that kind of propaganda campaign. Uh, today, it's tempting to look at Fred as a, as a hero and a symbol. Um, but to stop there freezes him in time and history and makes, it, makes him into something unattainable. And just as some, some people want to separate other civil rights heroes from the movements that gave birth to them. Um, for many of us, Sanse, who came of age at the right moment to want to win redress and to join the redress movement um, on behalf of our own parents and grandparents, it was politically and psychologically liberating to discover that Japanese Americans had not gone to camp wholeheartedly, and that someone like Fred Korematsu had challenged the government at great personal cost. The stories of resistance like Fred's fueled the redress movement, gave it clarity, and inspired commitment. In return, the growing redress movement gave Fred a platform to put a spotlight on the Bill of Rights and the racism of the incarceration. I think this is really important to notice because um, in the years since his uh, Supreme Court defeat and the redress movement, there was there was no nobody was interested in listening to Fred Karamatsu during that time period. Um, so why do I talk about the redress movement? I think we're faced today with attacks on civil liberties that are so terrible that we need a movement now. And maybe it would help more of us to understand what uh, the movement was. So what was the redress movement? It was not just one organization. There were churches, there were artists and musicians, Asian American student organizations, as well as three major national organizations, the NCRR, the JACL, and NCJAR, which had different perspectives and strategies for winning redress. The redress movement wasn't made of just one kind of person. There were Nisei and Sansei. There were Japanese American attorneys and elected officials, but significantly, there were also a lot of teachers and gardeners, working class Japanese Americans. Fred Korematsu himself had been a welder and a draftsman. Individuals may inspire us, but we need a movement to bring the full force of our people to bear against the attacks on civil liberties and against basic human rights. We need to unite as a community and organize so that we can join in force with other communities and peoples. So since the attacks on the World Trade Center in 2001, there's been a steady escalation of anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant scapegoating during the 2016 election. Uh, there were open calls to replicate the World War II detention of Japanese Americans, and that horrified us that there were many people, individuals, who spoke up. But when um, the Muslim ban was issued by Trump in 2017, some of us former religious activists and movement activists from the 60s, 70s, and 80s decided it was time to move beyond an individual response, and we formed a group called the Nikkei Resistance. When ICE escalated and tore children from their parents in the southern border, we reached out to people we knew from NCRR in Los Angeles, and we joined with other Japanese Americans around the country. The Never Again Is Now campaign was born out of that effort to unite Japanese Americans nationwide. So we've seen the deportation of fathers and mothers to Mexico and the deportation of Southeast Asians. All of these are families with mixed citizenship status, just as World War II Japanese Americans had mixed citizenship status. The Issei were not citizens, and the Nisei were citizens. This kind of mixed status makes families subject to gross separation and suffering. We have an obligation to stand up and fight back against the same forces of division and exclusion that target our parents and grandparents. It is the same thing. When former attorneys said, we don't want this to happen to anybody else, they, 
They were right, and they were looking at the future, but it's now, it's happening now, as the speakers have laid out. Um, Nikkei Resistors wants to build an inclusive, progressive, multi-generational organization that can unite and mobilize Japanese Americans against exclusion, against deportations, and detentions. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So when I was an undergrad at UC Berkeley a long, 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 long time ago, and I had a lot more hair than I have now, um, there was an exhibit uh, that, was, that was there for a while. I actually visited the exhibit with my family. They had pictures of people in horse stalls at Tanferan and other pictures that, are, that actually are really famous in terms of showing really how stark and how difficult it was to live in these concentration camps. So after my family kind of went through it together, I, I wandered back there another day and I stood in front of this one particular photo that actually has my grandfather sitting there and my aunt sitting in the background and they're sitting in a horse stall at the Tanfer and Racetrack. But there is no more Tanfer and Racetrack. The shopping center, Tanfer and is on the side of that racetrack. But looking at that photo of my grandfather and my aunt there, it just sent me this message of, they're sitting in a horse stall. This is not for human habitation. This is a horse stall. And I know in, in watching the Fred Carlson film, he said that he would have rather stay in the federal prison because to go to the Tampa and Holtz horse stall was, was worse than being in the prison, which is really a sad, sad story. So, I think um, we all know that Fred Korematsu was a true hero in the civil rights movement. And I think if Fred were alive today, he would be appalled by um, President Trump's immigration policies. He would be really appalled. In 2012, President Obama established the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, known as the DACA program, that provided temporary relief for undocumented youth. Around 800,000 young people have benefited from this program, and Asian Law Alliance and many other organizations in this area have helped thousands of young people um, you know, get their work authorization, better their lives, better their families, um, feel not so fearful of deportation. But what would President Trump do? He would terminate the program. He would terminate this program that benefited so many people. Luckily, the, the federal courts stepped in and reestablished the program in part. But now we are in a situation where uh, we're, we're, we're hearing things like Trump wants to make a deal, a deal where he would fully reestablish DACA if Congress would agree with his obsessive desire to build a wall between U.S. and Mexico. To that, all of us need to say, no deal, no wall. What is needed is comprehensive immigration reform that offers a path to U.S. citizenship for all undocumented immigrants in the United States. What can we do? Go to the United We Dream website and sign a petition urging and calling on Congress for comprehensive immigration reform. Second issue I want to address briefly here is since 1998, more than 16,000 Southeast Asian Americans from Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam have been issued orders of deportation. The majority of these deportation orders are for old criminal records. Most of these immigrants came to the United States as refugees fleeing U.S. wars, bombings, and genocide. Many of them encountered challenges during their initial resettlement, including high rates of poverty, post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of the youth growing up grew up in really impoverished neighborhoods, sometimes turned to gangs and crime as a means of survival. The vast majority of these immigrants live in the United States in a perpetual state of uncertainty, constantly under the threat of deportation. The Trump administration has aggressively cracked down on all immigrants with criminal convictions, ignoring that many have transformed their lives and have 
really contributed to this country, have built careers, have uh, built families. And deportation would result in the breaking up of these families where maybe the primary breadwinner would be lost and removed. So if you are in criminal court and you're low income and you cannot afford to hire an attorney, uh, an attorney will be appointed for you at no cost. Here in Santa Clara County, these services are provided by the Public Defender's Office. However, in deportation proceedings in immigration court, while you do have a right to attorney, if you are low income, an attorney is not provided to you. This has really created a system where many low-income immigrants have been unrepresented before an immigration judge because deportation proceedings are not considered criminal in nature. Although being deported to a country where you suffer from genocide uh, and you might die if you are sent back seems to be a criminal matter. Also, back in 1996, immigration laws were drastically changed so that immigration judges no longer have very, they have very little discretion in terms of looking at a person's uh, deportation case. They, these rigid laws really make it difficult or impossible for an immigration judge to consider any factors in looking at each individual case. And even prior to 1990, a criminal defense attorney could actually return to criminal court before the sentencing judge and ask for what was called a judicial recommendation against deportation. The sentencing judge could determine that uh, sending a person back, deporting them, was, was too much punishment and that maybe the, the penalty they, they were uh, imposed on for the criminal matter was enough and being, deportation, being deported was too much. Unfortunately, in 1990, Congress abolished this right of criminal justice judges to issue these recommendations against deportation. So what can you do about this? We're actually in the National Week of Action to end Southeast Asian deportations. It began Saturday, January 19th, and it lasts until tomorrow. We need to send messages to Congress to take action. You can find more information at the Southeast Asian Resource Action Center's Facebook page. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Executive Order 9066, forcing 120,000 Japanese Americans into concentration camps. For the past 39 years, the Nihonmachi Outreach Committee commemorates the signing of Executive Order 9066 with the annual Day of Remembrance program. There are flyers on the table on the side. Please join us on Sunday, February 17th. Uh, the program begins at 5.30 at the San Jose Buddhist Church Beth Spring Gym. The program will fe feature attorney Don Tamaki, one of the attorneys that was involved in the Corn Master Corn Nova's case. Teresa Castellanos will also be on the panel. San Jose Taco will perform. Please join us at the Day of program. I was honored to have met Fred Korematsu a number of times. He would come down to the Day of Remembrance programs here in San Jose. He came to a number of Asian Law Alliance events. Let's make a commitment to speak out and to get involved in Fred Korematsu's memory. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, first of all, I just a couple housekeeping details that I overlooked. Um, uh, the, uh, there are questions that any of you may have. There are cards that are being circulated or that you were given when you came in. If you have questions for any of our panelists, please write them on the cards, and one of our volunteers will be picking those up uh, so that we can um, uh, have uh, them forwarded to our panel. Uh, if any of you are attorneys, uh, please note that today's event does qualify for MCLB credit thanks to the Filipino American Bar Association of Northern California. Um, uh, they have been kind <coughs> enough to provide MCLB credit. To get that credit, you do need to sign up for that. And I do want to thank any of the attorneys who are here today, um, some of whom are on this panel. By the way, I want to just uh, do a shout out here because I think that Zara Ballou and Richard Conda 
through what they did as young attorneys um, is really a role model for what you can do with a law degree to be engaged in the community, to speak out, and to be active. Um, so often now a lot of people are looking at careers in law and their view of it is shaped by what they see in the media and these are people who may not be necessarily acting for the benefit of their community. Um, look to these two particularly. Um, I also want to uh, mention that the Fred T. Cormontu Institute has been kind enough and Karen hand carried them here. Uh, there are teachers' kids. If any of you are teachers or educators and you want to know how you can teach in your classroom about Fred Cormont's legacy, about Executive Order 9066, about the legal challenges that were brought to it, about the relevancy of those activities. They are not just history. As Teresa said, never again is now. And the message of why, of, of, of the history behind that and how that plays out in today's government. Um, if you want to be teaching your students about that, we have teacher's kits here. Please see me. I have the forms. I have the teacher's kits. I'll be here after the program. And I'd be more than happy to make sure that you get one of those teaching kits. The teaching kits include uh, both the four and a half minute version and a 22 minute version of the Emmy Award winning documentary of Civil Rights and Wrongs, the Fred Chief Korematsu story. If you haven't seen that documentary, and I know a number of you have, um, it is an incredibly moving piece of documentary filmmaking. We will be showing it at 3.15 at the museum across the street. Uh, for those of you who are teachers and educators, you can get copies of that documentary to use in your classroom along with teaching kits, instructional materials, lesson plans, um, so please, please see me um, after this program to get that information. Finally, um, as judges, we cannot speak up on political matters. As someone once said, Roberta, when you become a judge, you lose your First Amendment rights. <laughs> You're right, I do. Um, but I can encourage all of you to speak up. We can, as a court, put on programs to bring um, speakers such as this before you. And there's another way you can speak up, and that is as a juror. If you're called to a jury duty, that's your opportunity to participate in the legal process. And there's another very important thing. We are currently recruiting for the civil grand jury of the Santa Clara County Superior Court. This is a huge time commitment. I recognize it. Our civil grand jurors sometimes work as many as 25 hours a week. They do it for a period of a year. But during that time, they participate in some of the most important issues in our county. If you are over the age of 18, if you've been a resident of the county for a year, um, if you're a citizen of the United States, and yes, citizenship's a requirement to be on the civil grand jury, but we really want a civil grand jury that reflects the diversity of our community. So please, please see me. If you or someone you know might be interested in serving on the civil grand jury, I have information about that as well. And um, thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, add uh, following up in uh, uh, judge, uh, judge's comments uh, about our curriculum kids. If you, if you have uh, children, grandchildren, any teacher can go to the CoreMonsterInstitute.org website and sign up for the curriculum kit free of charge. That's what we do for fundraising. I want to be sure that these materials get into teachers' hands because as we all know, all these budgets get cut. And, uh, and and it's important that we, you know, we felt like it was important to help teachers as much as possible. And the, the lesson plans in our curriculum aligns with um, the C3 framework, which is uh, uh, college, community, and career, and uh, also um, uh, is uh, uh, aligned with elementary, middle school, and high school. 
uh, so that teachers can scaffold the lesson plans according to the age level and, um, and the need, and then we keep um, uh, adding to that. Also on our website, uh, we'll, be, we'll be premiering our new PSA for uh, Fred Cormont's Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. You go to it on January 30th. It's great because it's, it's um, students that are doing the PSA, and it's really uh, very heartwarming to, for them of all races to talk about um, Fred Cormont today. So please uh, uh, spread the word. Thank you. One more thing that I forgot. How could I do this? Uh, this is not the only event that this um, uh, multi-community organization um, partnership puts together. On Wednesday, uh, that's Fred Cormont, uh, Fred T. Cormont's Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution, Wednesday, January 30th, at the Santa Clara County Superior Court. Uh, Professor Margaret Russell, who is a noted constitutional law scholar and uh, professor at Santa Clara University School of Law, will be speaking at the courthouse. Uh, this is an event that's really geared for lawyers, law students, but because what she, but anybody who has an interest in hearing about the Korematsu cases from the 1944 U.S. Supreme Court decision, which upheld the constitutionality of the internment order, uh, through the writ of quorum notice proceeding which uh, Judge Marilyn uh, Patel issued an order overturning Fred Korematsu's constitution uh, uh, conviction all the way up to Trump versus Hawaii. Now Trump versus Hawaii, as you may know, Karen um, and um, the children of Gordon Hirabayashi and Minya Sui signed on to a brief to the U.S. Supreme Court urging that the U.S. Supreme Court once and for all overturned the Cor uh, Cormatsu versus the United States decision and say it is no longer legal precedent. Um, what uh, happened was unfortunate and fortunate. The fortunate part is that Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the U.S. Supreme Court, held, uh, wrote and said, let's be absolutely clear. Korematsu versus United States is overturned in the court of history. It is not legal precedent. It is not part of the constitutional law of this country. That's wonderful. But then what they went on to do was they went on to uphold the travel ban. And Justice Sotomayor, and joined by Justice Ginsburg in a dissent that if you're a legal scholar or just a legal nerd, but it bears reading because in it, Justice Sotomayor went through the similarities between the facts underlying the executive order 9066 and the Trump executive orders imposing the travel ban. And Justice Sotomayor said that what the majority of this U.S. Supreme Court done, has done is just redeploy the same faulty reasoning in the original 1944 U.S. Supreme Court decision and now substituted one wrongly decided case for another. So you may have read the press that the U.S. Supreme Court has, quote, overturned Korematsu versus United States. And yes, that's the language that Chief Justice Roberts wrote. But I urge you to read the dissent written by Justice Sotomayor to have an understanding of, a better understanding of what happened in Trump versus Hawaii. Thank you. scholars uh, really for, for the over, overruling, uh, it's not even clear what Justice Roberts overruled. 
Um, that really is the question. And uh, yes, I, I would encourage the reading of Justice Sotomayor's dissent. Uh, just so you know that you know the justices know what each other is going to write. So Justice Roberts had seen what Justice Sotomayor wrote. And, uh, and usually when she writes a dissent, she ends it with, I respectfully dissent. In this case, she just said, I dissent. And she went after the juggler, is what she did. Uh, and, uh, and was really very um, pointed in her uh, remarks. I, I felt honored that in her dissent, uh, she named me uh, and referred to my amicus brief um, by name, and so, and so that was very, I, I felt very honored. Uh, but what, just to be clear, because as Fred Corbonsu's daughter, uh, you know, as, you know, as was said, that Justice Roberts, uh, on one hand, in, in, his, in his majority opinion of Trump versus Hawaii, says, this case has nothing to do with Korematsu, but you know he's going to overrule it. And what he did, in our our opinion, is that he may have quote overruled Korematsu versus the United States and marginalized another group of people uh, and dishonored my father. We have a number of questions uh, from the audience here, and uh, a few of them have fairly common themes. One of them is sort of, uh, we'll start, we want to make sure we want to get as many questions as we can, so if everybody can limit their responses to about a minute or so. We're not trying to limit you, but we want to make sure that uh, we get as many as we can. Okay, <laughs> this is an interesting one for, we'll start with Richard. Um, advocacy, speak out, get involved, feel abstract. Can you please give specific ideas and action items that people with full-time jobs who are not lawyers can do to help? Richard? Well, you know, I, I've become more and more aware of this thing called Facebook. <laughs> and other things, these, these you know, new media that like, a lot of the young people are way more adept at than I am, but there are ways to just go on to your computer and click on stuff and why things or whatever things that there are easy ways to really to get involved and engage. It's, it's you can you know you can write a letter and make a phone call, but you can do it just as well over your computer. Can I say something? Yes, yeah, absolutely everybody. Um, I think it's really important to uh, explore those things that Richard was saying. There are there are uh, groups uh, like Ready for Action and Indivisible who are uh, organizing people to call, uh, strategically call Congress people and Senate, senators and uh, write letters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's really, really important. Everybody should join an organization, okay? I, I think everybody, if you can afford it, you should be donating to CARE and donating to the ACLU and uh, I, I'm on board with this, so you, I don't get any money from it. But I think to support the legal uh, actions to defend people against these uh, terrible policies. But I think it's really important to join an organization also. Like I was talking about the redress movement. You have to you have to get outside of your house and you have to go meet with other people and come up with a joint collective way that you're gonna respond. And that's gonna be the strength of the people's response to these policies. We, we can't just uh, uh, rely on attorneys. Um, there, there are, you know, one of the things that the director of the ACLU was saying that, that with uh, an upsurge in interest in the ACLU on donations, they have 300 attorneys, but the U.S. government has 11,000 attorneys. So I think, you know, I think it's really important that, that we all join an organization, join the organization that you think fits you the best. Um, join more than one organization, but get out there and do something with other people. I would also say, as you're attending these events, there's a newsletter sign up. Sign up for the newsletters. There's more than just this happening. And I would also say that for a lot of the communities, this is so overwhelming that they can't move. And 
so it's really important that other people move. I remember when the children at the beginning were being incarcerated, uh, the Women's March called the uh, rally to not separate children. And I've been an immigrant rights leader for three years, so most of the time if there's an immigrant rights march, I'm part of the organizing. This time I wasn't. And when I got there, I had to look for the immigrant rights people because most of them didn't show up. They were so tired and so overwhelmed and so distraught. And the beauty of that march was to see other people there. And I had to go find my little group of indigenous um, leaders and get my blessing. But once I got my blessing, because I had to feel nurtured, I was so overwhelmed too, that once I got my blessing, I could see the beauty of look at, we're seeing each other's humanity. And people who have never come out to a rally to support immigrant issues are here. And they came with their kids. And their kids made all kinds of signs. And it was such an incredibly beautiful moment. Even though that was my own critiques that I had about the rally and who the speakers were, they did it. And I think that's the time that we're living now, that we have to do something. And one of the things that for me is really important is that I don't want this time period to be how we responded to 45. I want to remember this time period about how we grew as a community, how we built bridges, and how we learned to stand in solidarity. So fundraising is part of my job, and I've had to figure out 19 different ways to say it. So I'll, you know, building on what Susan said is, sign up to be not just a member, but a monthly donor to an organization of your choice. Now do it at 5, 15, 30, 150, you know your budget. Um, but Sean King says make social justice a part of your monthly budget. And I'll tell you that on the nonprofit management side, and it's probably true for every nonprofit on this table, um, or at this table, that our monthly donors are our favorite donors. Because we know that no matter what, the bills get paid because of those people, right? And so just make that a part of your giving. Again, whatever amount works for you. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is think about what skill sets you can develop to be an ally, right? So do you know how to stop and help someone who is being stopped by the police, right? And do you know what to do there to be helpful as opposed to hurtful or get in the way? Do you know how to hear about when ice raids are happening? Do you know what to do if you see a hate crime or hate incident happening. And all of our organizations provide these trainings. And so learn those skills that, so that should you be in a moment where you are asked to step up and be a little bit uncomfortable so that your neighbors can be safe, you are prepared to do that. And then the last thing I'll say is I'm a big proponent of smart goals, right? Like can I, like I set a goal right now, I want to lose 15 pounds this year, right? That's you know, everyone's New Year's or my New Year's resolution. Can I measure it? at the end of the year. So I got a volunteer recently who said, you know, I tried to volunteer for an entire year after the election and I didn't really feel like I found a place. And so in 2019, my commitment is to go to one community event a month, at minimum, right? Like in Teresa and I, like once a week, twice a week, three times a week, all of us here, I saw many of you at the Women's March last weekend, right? If you're just going to one event a month, that gives you the flexibility to do your nine to five, to pay your bills, to take care of your family, and even the luxury to choose which event you're going to, but continue to show up because that honestly has been one of the most inspiring things for me post-election is how much people are showing up. Thank you, Karen. Uh, well, we're looking at fundraising because um, actually, uh, you know, we talked about our the, you know, the fundraising for you know, the fight in, in civil rights and, and certainly that's needed, but also, uh, you know, fundraising for education, and that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to teach about civil rights education in the school, so that by the time that people get, you know, to, to be young people, that they have, they're better educated, that they, that they can, they can uh, be participants, that they can be civically engaged, that uh, they keep fighting for, you know, democracy. Uh, if, if there was a, there's some students in Rhode Island that um, actually uh, uh, led a lawsuit against the school district in order to have um, a, a civic education in their school and to teach about what it does mean to be an American and, and what our democracy means and being a part of that. 
Uh, you know, it's it, it, like voting is is um, is a privilege we have in this country that people take for take advantage. But you know, you can help in the polls. You can make sure people get out there and vote. You can help in different in different ways. In, in the schools, you know, schools need help. Teachers need help. So what can you do locally for your community? Either your students, your your grandchildren, your friends, um, children. What, what in the classroom is needed as an assistance to, to the teacher as well? You know, share what you've learned here. Say, you know, well, there's this curriculum that, you know, you can, that, you know, you as a teacher can uh, order free of charge. And, you know, what, what are the teacher's workshops? I mean, I speak all over the country to different national uh, conferences in education. But it, you know, they're, the, the education people are not funding me. I have to fundraise in order to be able to um, help teachers and help students. Thank you, Karen. Uh, one thing that I wanted to do, because my, my, uh, when we did our show, which uh, uh, I said before we start talking about Fred Kormatsu, the icon, I want to talk to you a little bit about him as a father. And so this one question was interesting and suggested to you. I know it was painful for your father to lose the case in the face of this movement. And I thought about this when I was watching the documentary because I myself did not even think about the fact that he might have gotten shunned when he first came back to the camps after what he did. And this person was asking, did he ever find any acceptance and was he celebrated after that time like we do for him today? Well, whoever answered that question, thank you, because uh, you know, people don't, don't know that actually my father was vilified and ostracized by his own Japanese American community even from the time he was entered into the Tansaran Detention Assembly Center in in, uh, in San Bruno, um, you know, he because he had resisted the, the, the military orders, disobeyed them. He he was considered a troublemaker, and no one wanted him to continue with his case because they thought some harm might come to them. I mean, everyone was was afraid. But even you know, for especially. You know, families. You know, my my father had brought shame. Um, you know, my grandmother cried. My grandfather was disgusted. His brothers didn't even support him. And and growing up, we weren't even part of the Japanese American community until my father's case was reopened in 1983. But my my father was amazing because he didn't he didn't really blame anyone. He didn't have this chip on his shoulder. He was a kind and generous person and. He just believed in, in right and wrong, believed in, in his principles, believed that he, you know, he, he treated everyone like he wanted to be treated. And so when his case was, was um, vacated over turned in 1983 and everybody came up to congratulate him in this big courtroom in San Francisco and hugs and tears and everything, he could have very well said, okay, Japanese American community, you didn't want anything to do with me, why should I have anything to do with you? But, you know, as Susan knows, my, my, my father wasn't like that. He helped with redress of reparations. My parents, you know, became, you know, worked in the community, went to D.C., lobbied for the Civil Liberties um, Act, and, and was this, that's why everyone loved him. And at least, you know, he was able to, to enjoy that. But even when he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom or any honors, you know, he did so on behalf of all the Japanese Americans that had been incarcerated, and and that's just the kind of heart that um, that he had, and and you know that's he gave me this charge to carry on with education. About five months before he passed away, I thought, well, how am I going to do that? I'm not the attorney here, and uh, but he just believed in education so much. Uh, that and, and, and to be involved in the community. So my parents actually demonstrated what it is to be an American by being in the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and the church. And, the, and my father was in the, the International Alliance Club for 48 and a half years and the president twice of his own um, chapter. So, you know, there's different ways along, you know, along in life I've learned. You know, not everybody, not, if you have a young family, you're just busy doing that. Um, you know, as Zara said, but when you're older and you've got more time, find those ways that you can be involved. Because when you help others, you help yourself, and and that's and that's what we all want, and it makes you healthy, you know, as as a person, uh, and that's the opportunities that we have. Thank you.
We're going to go to some more questions here. Some of these are kind of more aimed at one of, one of the panelists. <coughs> so anybody that would like to have to uh, elaborate themselves, just raise your hand and we'll do it. But you don't have to answer each of these questions. Uh, so we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, someone wants to discuss the role of the faith community in the ongoing struggle for justice and the idea of whether how important the faith communities will be and also can they coalesce and become kind of a united voice. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things that we think about in our outreach work at CARE is we could find the Muslims at the mosque and move them to take action, or we can find the Muslims who aren't at the mosque and find them to take action. And we generally default towards the first one, because you know that if you go to the biggest mosque, you can easily find a couple of hundred people together. And if you can get to the imam who is talking to them, he can reach a couple of thousand people who are all held hostage during prayer and congregational services. <laughs> and the same is true for so many of our faith communities. And so I incredible potential in faith-based congregations to move people who are already coming together based on a shared set of values, right? They congregate weekly, daily, some regular basis, and you can get to them all at once. And they're united by the same values, and in all of the cases of all of the religions, their values push them to build better communities around them. One of our close partners in this work is uh, PACT, People Acting in Community Together, who many of you may know of. And what they do is they work with local congregations to move them to take action on issues like police accountability, educational access, racial justice, and, and so on. And so if you are in a big community that is not organizing for social justice, I think that there's an opportunity there for you to step up and say, OK, looking for 10, 15, 100 people that agree with me. Where do I find them? I find them there. And if you're in a congregation that's already taking action, you can be even stronger if you do it with other groups. And so feel free to reach out to CARE, to reach Muslim congregations, and, and to talk to reach a wider range of congregations across the region. Thank you. Um, Susan, let's have this one for you, because you had talked a little bit about rallying around reparations. And sometimes it is easy to kind of unite when we have something a sort of big common goal, something that everybody can address. This person wants to know, is there a major incident that we can rally around? How can we unite people to fight back? That's a really good question. I think uh, it's true. So the, the redress movement was focused, uh, was a pretty clear focus, is when a public apology and when individual uh, monetary reparations per individual. So that was pretty focused. So right now, the challenge is that there are many, many attacks on many, many communities. And because of the uh, news cycle, it's easy for things to fall out of view. Like, uh, for instance, I think um, if you uh, come up and talk to uh, Zara after, she could tell you all the uh, Muslim families who are, are in the process of fighting family separation. And it's, it's like a day-to-day like -day thing that happens behind the scenes. And I think that if you talk to somebody in the uh, Vieta community, that there are similar issues that people are individually trying to fight uh, these different attacks on their families. So, um, I think uh, Teresa uh, mentioned some big flashpoint things that I think are good to focus on, like the family separations and the detention of children. This is still going on. So um, uh, one of the things that um, the Gay Resisters is going to do is we're going to meet with Zoe Lofgren, who's our representative. And uh, she is, uh, because of the uh, 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 new Congress, is, uh, uh, Democratic majority. She's going to be the chair of the subcommittee on immigration. We're going to talk to her about uh, some of these issues and talk to about the possibility of hearings. So um, uh, it, it is it is difficult, but I think that's why that's why it's really important to join your organization so you can get together and talk about the thing that you're going to focus on. Because I th I think that's hard. A lot of people like go, oh my God, there's so much stuff. How can I do everything? Well, you, you can't do everything. No, nobody can do everything. But you can get together with your group, either that already exists, or you can put something together with like-minded neighbors or uh, people that you know, and pick something and start working on it. 
Um, a, a number of, it's just sort of an interesting question because it seems almost so basic. Uh, but Richard, maybe I can start with you because we know about the significance of the ruling that brought all this about, but then we have to always be reminded as we see is that it was overruling a previous Supreme Court decision. So now we see the conservative makeup of the Supreme Court now. What is the actual real significance of the Kormatsu case? And is there something foundation established there that people don't have to worry about it being taken away? As Karen and uh, uh, Roberto were talking about, the fact that they see erosion. What's the significance, as far as you can see, of this case? And is there a part of it that you think is not threatened, or do you think that it's all ultimately subject to being threatened? Yeah, I think that the interesting, the real interesting thing about the Karamanza case is, let's go back in history to the 1940s, when the government attorneys came to court, they basically committed fraud on the Supreme Court because they failed to reveal relevant evidence. And it wasn't until much, much later when there were some researchers looking into the files, they discovered all these letters and correspondence between attorneys saying, well, let's, let's, let's keep that from the court. So when the, when the Supreme Court actually heard and decided the court monster case, they didn't decide on a full record. And they decided on an incomplete record based on really misrepresentation by government attorneys. That's what allowed uh, Fred Cormontson's case later individually to be overturned because it was brought to the court's attention that this was fraud on the court, on the Supreme Court. So on an individual basis, that was really significant to, to, to kind of show that on the record, the Supreme Court really had been misled. And in a broader sense, I think it's troubling that the Cormontson case is now cited in another case which basically legalizes um, or targets another group. That's really troubling. And, and I think that um, is cause for concern that the court would do that. Uh, again, would in effect overrule Coromanta, but then again, is it, is it really overruled? I don't know. For Teresa, Teresa, especially with your background in not only social work, but also in the education system. Um, some of these, some of these incidents didn't even make it into history books for a long time. Now they are in history books, but are they being taught the right way as far as you're concerned? Is there enough breadth and depth to what's being taught to children so that they understand an issue? So for example, they might read about Korematsu and the decision, but are they learning about enough about the foundation of the information that helps you realize how it got to that point and then will help them in terms of evaluating issues in the future. Is that happening in education? I would say that we have a lot of committed educators that are doing the best they can under the conditions they have. I would also add to that, we fund California education at either between 41 and 49 out of 50 states. We are the richest state in the nation. We are the fifth largest economy and education is not a priority for us. Alabama and Mississippi spend more per child than we do. We have so much inequality that I who represent some of the unified men who get between 11 to 12,000 per child, Los Alcos gets between 19 and $22,000 per child. We have teachers who are currently in their seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th year of teaching, and they're still living with minor weeks. We have teachers who said, I would like to have a child someday, but I live in Silicon Valley. Will I ever be able to do that? We have districts, Lapidus Unified can pay $40,000 more for a principal than we can. So we're seeing a time period where we are really dealing with the consequences of not investing in education. So that is my critique where, with where we are in education. The other thing that I will add is that as a school board member, the place where I find inspiration is in the kids. Our kids are leading. They are seeing that the adults are not leading and they themselves are leading. It is so incredible. And when I see kids doing this, I'm like, you are suffering so much that you are seeing a reality that I didn't have to see. 
And I go to all the graduations. I go to middle school and high school graduations. I end up going to about 32 graduations per year. And last year, every child, high school or middle school, spoke about we are the future, we have power, we have responsibility to make change. And so that, to me, tells me you know about the housing situation. You know about the racism that's taking place. You know about the injustices that are taking place. And so we may not be telling our kids everything, but our kids are living this reality, and our kids are suffering. And, and that is producing a leadership, and that is producing a commitment, and our kids grew up in diversity. We grew up segregated. Our kids have grown up in a diversity that we don't even understand, and they appreciate it. So my hope is with our, our youth and the kids that we have now. Anybody else want to address that? Okay. Um, Karen, I know that you're on a tight schedule here, and you'll be leaving soon, so I want to give you a chance to. Are you optimistic, given everything that you're experiencing during this time, and all the different events you're going to, and all the different people that you're meeting, and everything like that? What's your outlook right now in terms of how Chroma today will go? How do you think that they will be treated in the future? Well, thank you for asking that question. Uh, you know, certainly I, I think what my father, you know, represents uh, is, you know, is for, for all Americans. And when I say all Americans, I believe in supporting those who are, are documented and undocumented. Um, I think that's what, we, that's what American means. And we, um, I, mean, I, I too am encouraged that when I, when I speak to students, um, that's what gets me up in the morning, I have to tell you, because they're the ones that, that uh, I, you know, they, they're very hungry and they're like sponges and they take all this in and they, and they understand a lot more than people give them credit for. And I think that's what's really um, exciting and, and that's why I spend all this time, our, we're a national program, so our curriculum kids now have impacted all 50 countries. Um, even 13 countries have requested our curriculum because they look at Japanese American incarceration as a human rights violation. Um, so there are so many different layers to my father's story and what he represents. And I think that's, that's, um, that's why you know, his story resonates and is, um, is this American story. It's not just Japanese American or, or West Coast, but an American story that um, people can understand, you know, when you've been marginalized and, uh, you know, as we've had this history in this country, and that's what we hope are, we can stop, you know, and it, it, at least to have less and less, and, and it's this generation and future generations that I concentrate, concentrate on so that, you know, we, for them, they won't have the bullying and the prejudice that I had when, I was, when my brother and I were growing up. Um, and you know, and to teach respect, you know, we've lost that in this country, and, and that's what I I really focus on is having students learn that, and we we all need to do that by example, um, you know, to demonstrate respect and appreciate our differences, not to be afraid of them, and I I'm hoping that that's what my father's day represents as it keeps growing. I'm going to. Actually, from here, from on Wednesday, I'll be in Phoenix um, because, believe it or not, Arizona is interested in a Fred Cormonson today in perpetuity. I know it's hard to believe, but um, you know, it was thanks to the Cormonson Center up in Seattle at the, at the Seattle University School of Law that they fought the ethnic studies um, case that you know they were trying to have that eradicated from Tucson, and and that case is one. So now they have to put ethnic studies back in schools. So little by little, we all have to you know, keep fighting and do this collectively. Um, and the you know, teachers are the ones, you know, have, uh, this morning I just spoke at a workshop in San Francisco. There's some schools up there where you know, these teachers are like, they can't hardly keep teachers, they're leaving. You know, they're not getting paid enough. They've got difficult students. Uh, the class sizes are too big. You know, all these kinds of issues. And whatever I can do, you know, on our part, to, to, you know, because we, we support whether it's public or, or private or charter, you know, education is education. 
I'm not prejudiced. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, in, in Philadelphia, they're going to be issuing um, a Frank Cormonte Day proclamation. They hope to work on it as an in perpetuity, um, you know, for next year. And so, and, but these people come to me. I mean, they, you know, they, uh, it's not like I'm going out to these different states, uh, which is truly amazing. But, you know, that's, that's what my father's story means, and that's why it's so important to, to have this day, who, you know, a person who represents all Asian Americans, because, you know, Asian Americans have been like the model minority, right? Oh, they don't need any help, they don't need any, you know, they, they, they don't have any needs, and, and that's not true. Um, that we all need to support each other. And you know, my father is the first day in U.S. history to have a, a statewide day named after him, and you know, it, and he represents all those that are that are you know have been marginalized as well. I wrote a I wrote a, a, an op-ed for the New York Times a day after the decision of of uh, Trump versus Hawaii on June 26, so it came out June um, 27 in the New York Times, and I um, I said all the Supreme Court did was to um, replace one injustice for another. And you know, and, and we know that we, you know, we now we, we come to the realization that we can't count on the executive branch. We, you know, sorry, not really on the, on the judicial, but we've got some exceptions here. Um, I would say, um, but it's the legislative, right? That's where we're going to make the difference. We can all collectively do that, uh, and and to be part of that change. And you know, it, 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 you know, as as it was said, you know, this is this is now. And you know, for more, I mean, I have to tell you this one one. I know I'm supposed to stop. One is quick story. But the reason that the state of Florida has Fred Cormonte Day of Civil Liberties in the Constitution was the um, uh, the middle school of Clearwater, Florida, outside of Tampa. Their teacher, who I didn't even know. They're, if they at least they in seventh grade there they teach civics education you know we are here most most classes are like twelfth grade too bad too late because some of these kids have left school you know they don't even get to have the civics if they're lucky to have it at all so these students are, are you know got a great teacher talking about civics they're googling around they find you know Fred Cormatsu they find out their state their state's named after him and then they have a state senator that visits them and talk about you know, civics and, and, and you know, how bills are created and all that. So the students say to the senator, we would like to have a Fred Cormonte day. Well, one day really wasn't was a day off, but it's okay, we'll take anything. And so these students, the senator says, well, if you write letters to me, I will create a bill and, uh, and, and take it, you know, to, to the Senate. Well, they did. Uh, the senator took it, you know, to the floor of the Senate. It passed. He had a colleague in the House that sponsored the bill. It was all unanimous. Um, it's it's not a holiday, but that's why the state of Florida has Fred Cormonte Day of Civil Liberties of the Constitution, thanks to the power of students and the power of pen, meaning you know writing. You know, we lost some of that too. So that's that's what that's what encourages me. And so I hope to see that in my lifetime for, for what my father represents, uh, because that's, that's what this country is about. Thank you very much, Karen. I don't know if we have any more down to our last couple of questions, so if anybody else has one, uh, be sure to uh, bring it to us here. Uh, one of the questions actually has been addressed a number of times, which is how to engage our youth more into this process. Uh, this one might be a little bit more the last question here, a little more straightforward than maybe for Susan or Richard. What effect will the enactment and rollout of real ID make to our current immigration procedures? You know, I think uh, we're, we've come to this point in time where we understand that there's some need for security and what have you, but I think we've kind of gone overboard in a lot of ways. And I think it's, it's really based on fear. When people are fearful that they are willing to accept things that maybe in the long run are, are not in the best interest of everyone. So I, I think it's a, it's a, we're going down a top, kind of a, a dangerous road in, in that area. Susan? Richard, cover the well Okay. <laughs> All right, well, that is uh, the end of our Q&A. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, thank you. Very much. I just want to thank him.
everybody for coming out here. One of the things that everybody has been talking about is getting involved. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, I was with a volunteer organization uh, in the Silicon Valley, and we realized that for a lot of people, the hardest thing to do is actually go out and get involved. People would rather write a check than go out and um, get involved. And while we certainly encourage you to write a check, we want to thank you all for coming out, being involved, and you could have been doing so many other things if you chose to do that for us here. And uh, we want to thank you all for taking the time to be here. And um, I'm going to be heading out to a hip hop concert that my daughter is in. So uh, I want to, before I do that, though, but I won't leave until I hear the very important messages from Aggie Nicoro. Uh She is going to close out this program. Uh, Aggie is uh, going to talk a little bit about what's been going on here. Um, but again, I want to thank you all for inviting me and for participating here. Thank you very much. Aggie Iremoto will now close out our program as we say the news. Back to you. The panel inspires me again. Every year when I hear stories, it inspires me to get even more involved with the museum because part of our mission is to tell the story. And we need to be out there and, um, was it, oh, I know, it was Karen who said last year that um, she didn't even know what happened to her father until she was in the 11th grade and heard about it in a mystery class. And she said, Kuramachi, that's my name. <laughs> and she went home and asked her mother, and that's when her mother talked about it. And we talked about the fact that it's probably cultural. You know, in Japanese culture, you don't go out and <laughs> accuse the president of imprisoning us, that kind of thing. And um, so we need to tell the story. So thank you so much. I want to thank the students, Evergreen, for, for their help today. And um, it's great to see these, these young faces out there. And Roberta and uh, um, Robert, you made it. You made it. Oh. Thank you. It was great. And I want to invite you to come to the museum across the street. It's free today in honor of Koremazu. And we're open until 4 o'clock. We do have a small Koremazu exhibit over there also. And store. So thank you again. See you next year.